So, um, Philippe Aguillon is professor of the College de France and the London School of Economics. He is an internationally recognized expert on the economics of growth. And with Peter Howitt, he pioneered the Schumpeterian growth paradigm that was subsequently used to analyze the design of growth policies and the role of the state in the growth process. And much of this work is summarized in the joint books and Dogenes Growth Theory and Economics of Growth. His new book, The Power of Creative Destruction, advocates for creating a better capitalism by understanding and harnessing the power of creative destruction, innovation that disrupts, but that over the past 200 years has also lifted societies to previously unimagined prosperity. And we will hear from Philippe Aguillon just in a moment. And as I mentioned before, his keynote speech will be followed by a one-on-one -on -one discussion with Pauli, who has been Deputy Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund since 2021. And prior to joining the fund, he worked at the People's Bank of China, most recently as Deputy Governor, where he played an important role in the reform of state-owned banks, the drafting of China's anti-money laundering law, and the internationalization of the renminbi. With that, I would like to hand over to Philippe Aguillon with his keynote address, Creative Destruction to Achieve Sustained, Green and Inclusive Growth. Thank you very much. How long do I have? How, how long do I have? Excuse me, can you hear me? Do you, can you, uh, how long should it be? How long should I speak? About 30 minutes, Philippe. 30, 30 minutes. Okay, very good. Okay, can you? Uh, so, okay, so one second, let me share screen. Uh, can, you see the, can you see the slides? Not yet. We see you. Yes. Oh. Now you can. Okay. Yeah, now we see the sheets. Uh, now you see the slide. Okay, so now I should, okay. So, uh, uh, okay, slide show. Voilà. Okay, so uh, since I have 30 minutes, I will, uh, I will just tell you a bit about the creative destruction paradigm and the latest things that I can do with it. So uh, the, the, the term creative destruction was invented by Sh Joseph Schumpeter to refer to the process whereby new innovations displace old technologies. New innovations make old technologies obsolete. But when I studied growth economics, there was no model of uh, growth based on creative destruction, no nor were there empirical uh, studies of creative destruction. So with Peter Howitt, we, uh, in 1987, we decided to, uh, to build a new growth model that would embody creative destruction. And the model rests on three main ideas. The first idea is that long-run growth is driven by cumulative process of innovation. Each innovator builds upon previous innovations. The second idea is that innovations result from entrepreneurial activity motivated by the prospect of innovation rents. And the third idea is creative destruction. New innovations displace old technologies. And so you see right away that at the heart of the growth process, there is a contradiction. On the one hand, you need innovation rents, which are temp typically temporary monopoly rents for someone who invents a new product or a cheaper way to produce things. Uh, uh, for a while, he becomes a monopolist or a local monopolist and he gets rents. So those rents are there necessary to motivate innovation it's for, because you want to, to get those rents that you innovate. But on the, on the other hand, uh, 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 those rents can be used ex post to prevent, to prevent future innovations and block new entry because yesterday's innovators, they don't want themselves to be subject to creative destruction. And therefore, they will use their rents to block entry and to prevent future innovation. And regulating capitalism is largely about how to manage this contradiction. Schumpeter himself was very pessimistic. He thought the first innovators would turn into entrenched conglomerates that would successfully uh, prevent subsequent entry and subsequent innovation. But here we are more optimistic. We think there are forces that can avert the pessimistic prediction of Schumpeter. Okay? So uh, what's new with this paradigm? There's been other growth models by Solo, by Romer, by others, by Haro and Goma. But the big difference between uh, any other model and the Schumpeterian model is that the Schumpeterian model gives center stage to firm dynamics and to cross firm heterogeneity. It's all about the contrast between incumbents and entrants and the conflicts between them, the contrast between leaders and followers, the contrast between small and large firms, and a bit about firm growth and firm exit. 
And, uh, and this uh, new uh, theory, which really is all about heterogeneity, needs, uh, needed a, a, a new dialogue between growth theory and empirics. We needed econometrics, which is much more micro-founded, very much, my, much more firm-level data econometrics, okay? So I will, uh, uh, I will go fast now. I want to say, well, what you can do with this framework is to do three kinds of things. You can first revisit some main enigma in economic history. You can question some common wisdoms, and you can rethink the future of capitalism. So one enigma is secular stagnation. We've seen that in the US, uh, 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 since the early 2000s, uh, uh, the average yearly TFP growth, so we average the yearly TFP growth rate, on average, it's been going down a lot after going up between 95 and 2005. And that's particularly true in IT producing sectors, the black curve, and in IT using sectors, the, green, the, the gray curve. And it has to do a lot with IT. And the, the most, in chapter six of the power of creative destruction, we, we entertain various explanations, but the most convincing is that with the IT revolution, you had the emergence of superstar firms. You know, Google, Walmart, uh, Amazon, uh, uh, Microsoft, Facebook, and uh, those firms were better organized, and they could very good. They took advantage of the IT revolution. So when they grew and when they expanded uh, uh, over the many sectors of the U.S. economies, that, that first boosted average productivity growth. That's where the curve that you have here. But then you see what happened is that eventually these firms, you know, discouraged entry by non-superstar firms. And that's why you see the rate of new entry going down as of the early 2000s. So it's very much the Schumpeter fear. These innovators, these big firms, that, that firm, they became very big through merger and acquisition. They ended up discouraging uh, uh, non-superstar firms. And they, uh, the, the problem is that they became very big because they could do merger and acquisition without any limit. Competition policy was not adapted to the digital era. It was not there to prevent merger and acquisition that would discourage future entry and future innovation. And you can see here the average, at the same time as growth is going down, the average markup is going up, that's the, gray, the red curve, but not so much because within firm is going up, the within markup uh, evolution is the blue curve, and you don't see any upward trend. It's because, the, it's because of a, re a reallocation effect, the black curve. It's because the high markup firms, which was Google, Microsoft, uh, Walmart, those firms became more and more pervasive in the U.S. economy. And that's why the average markup went up over time in the U.S. at the same time as growth went down. Okay? So the way out uh, is to renew, is to reform competition policy, is to maybe break up firms, to, to reform competition policy, to deal with these superstar firms so that they will no longer prevent, uh, 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 they no longer prevent the, uh, uh, can you see my slides or they, you cannot see my slides? Can you see them? You can see my slides when I pass them? Yes? No? Okay, I don't, I don't know that. Okay. Yes? Could you, could you please, could you please move your slides, please? And put it in a presentation mode? But it is in presentation mode. You don't see them? You don't see my slides? We, we can see, but it's a stick to one slide, to the first one. Oh, God. I don't, that's horrible. And now you can see them? Oh, la, 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 la. Oh, you, now you can see my slides passing? We can share the phone. We can, we can do the presentation for you if you want. So it doesn't work. When I do the sharing, you don't, you, you can't see it. We see it. Move. You can't see my slides. It doesn't move. It doesn't move when I do that? It doesn't no. move? Oh, my God. That's really the problem of WebEx. You see, Zoom works much, much better. Uh, uh, what can I do there? Oh, God. Uh, what can I do there? Can you pass my slides? Uh, you don't have my slides. Uh, what can I do, Nadine? Can I send you my slides? Yes, yeah, we, we, we can do it. We can do it. Okay, so let me, uh, 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 can you send me an email now and by return mail, I send you my slides. I'm sorry for that. It means that the WebEx is not a good system. Now, let me try again, okay? Let me try again. Now, do, do, if you see, if I, you can see if, if I pass my slides now. 
Can you see my slides now? No? Can you see my slides? Yes, 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 we can see. Now it works. Perfect. Okay, so I start again the whole thing then. So I wanted to tell you, I start again, I'm sorry then. Now I pass my slides, you can see my slides, if I change them. Yes, we can. We can. Okay, it worked everywhere, you know, I presented this hundreds of times. Okay, so, uh, uh, so I go back, creative destruction is a process whereby new innovation displays old technologies. We build the growth model based on three main ideas. Long run growth is driven by cumulative innovation where each innovator builds upon previous innovations. Innovations result from entrepreneurial activities motivated by the prospect of innovation rents. And creative destruction, new innovations displace old technologies. There is a contradiction at the heart of the growth process. On the one hand, you need innovation rents to motivate new innovations. But the problem is that those rents can be used ex post by yesterday's innovators to prevent future innovations because they don't want themselves to be subject to creative destruction. And regulating capitalism is about to manage this contradiction. Can you see when I change my slides now? Yes. 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 Okay, okay. So uh, this paradigm uh, uh, is, uh, uh, is new because you see all other models of growth had no heterogeneity. Here it's all about the difference between incumbents and entrants, between leaders and followers, between small and large firms. And for that, you need a new econometrics, which is much more micro funded okay? And now I want to tell you about three things you can do with this framework. One is to revisit enigma of economic history. Second is to question some common wisdoms. Three is to rethink the future of capitalism. So one enigma is secular stagnation. Can you see the figure? Yeah, now you see it? Yes. yes, yes. Okay. So you can see that there's been a decline in the average rate of TFP growth over the period 2005-2017, after growth going up. And uh, it's very much in IT producing sectors, the, the black curve, in IT using sectors, the gray curve, okay? But what happened is that, in fact, it's very much due to superstar firms that emerged thanks to the IT revolution, Walmart, Google, Amazon, uh, 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 Microsoft, well, they were more productive and they knew how to take advantage of the IT uh, technology. And uh, when they grew, that first boosted average productivity growth in the US. But then what happened is that they, through merger and acquisitions, they expanded through all sectors of the economy. And each time they discouraged non-superstar firms from uh, entering the market. And you can see the rate of entry of new firms going down uh, uh, in the US as of the 2000s, okay? And, uh, uh, and in fact, at the same time, you can see here is the markup. Can you see the markup slide? You see the slide with the markups? Yes? Yes. Yes? Okay. You can see the red curve is the average markup in the US economy. It's going up. But uh, you see that the blue curve is not going up. That's the evolution of markups within firms. Markups have not gone up so much within firms. But it's the black curve that goes up. That's a reallocation effect. The average markup has not gone up so much because within firm markup have gone up. It's because the high markup firms, which were these superstar firms, have become more pervasive in the US economy. So it's very much the Schumpeter syndrome. In fact, these firms have become very prominent and they ended up being a barrier to new entry and new innovation by non-superstar firms. And the way out is to reform competition policy in the US to reduce the power of these firms and let entry increase again of new firms. And that's why the Biden administration tried to do a year ago, have this reform of the competition policy. Hopefully, the hope is that those reforms will uh, yield results and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, again, initiate an upward trend in growth in the US. Okay, <clears throat> so now uh, another enigma is the middle income trap. If you look, for example, Korea, those are the growth, the uh, average annual growth rate of GDP per capita in Korea after Korean War. And you see they were very high, but you see that they decline uh, ending in, uh, as of the uh, 1990-2000. And why they decline? It's because, you know, Korea was growing. There are two ways to grow. 
you can grow either by imitating the frontier, that's catching up with the frontier, a bar, or you can grow by innovating upon yourself. I call that frontier innovation. You go from A to gamma A, where gamma is greater than one. So the mu M part is the uh, imitation or the catching up, and the mu N part is the frontier innovation. When you are a country very much below the frontier, like Korea was after the war, uh, 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 the Korean War, or like China was when Deng Xiaoping took over power, uh, the main source of growth is, the, is this. But when you get closer to a bar, the main source of growth becomes frontier innovation. But for frontier innovation, it's very important to have competition. <clears throat> Here, I'm showing the effect of competition on innovation and growth in firms. Imagine you are a classroom. Uh, some, some of you are better, the top of the class. Some of you are the bottom of the class. And I, let, I open the door, and I let a new student in, which, who is very good. What will happen? The top of the class will work harder to remain the top of the class. That's the blue curve. The firms that are close to the frontier in their own sector, they react to more competition by innovating more. They innovate to escape competition. And as a result, they grow and they innovate more. Uh, but the, the orange curve are the bottom of the class. The bottom of the class, when I let the new student in, they were already discouraged being the bottom. They will be even more discouraged. And you see innovation and growth going down. But now the more advanced the country is, the higher the fraction of blue firms over orange firms. The blue firms are the firms that are close to the technological frontier in their sectors. The orange firms are the firms that are far below the technological frontier in their sector. The uh, more advanced the country is, the, the higher the fraction of blue firms and the lower the fraction of orange firms. So the prediction is that the, the more advanced you are, uh, uh, the more you should have competition. Competition is good for UN. If you are growing mainly through catching up, uh, competition is not so important. But when you are growing through frontier innovation, it's good to have more competition because you innovate at the frontier, you know, to escape competition. And uh, the problem is that in Korea, when during the catching up phase, you had the emergence of, of large conglomerates called the chow balls. And the chow balls, not only they inhibit, in, they prevented entry of new innovating firms in, in Korea, but they also put pressure on the Korean government to delay the necessary implementation of competitive or pro-competition policy and openness policy. But what happened in Korea is that, as you know, they went through a financial crisis at the, in the late 1990s. And uh, it has a, but one good effect of that crisis is that it weakened the power of the showballs, and that had a double effect. First, it encouraged entry and by innovating non-showball firms, but at the same time, what it did is to force the Korean government to accept the implementation of more pro-competition, pro-openness policy, very much under the pressure of IMF, actually. It's IMF who pushed Korea to reform. And the late 90s was a very good period to push the Korean government to finally move towards more competition and more openness. And that's why you had growth going up a bit. But then the trouble became strong again and growth goes down. So it's very interesting that you can... Again, it's a bit the Schumpeter fear that, you know, you have emergence of big firms. Here, not only they prevent entry of innovating firms, but they also prevent government from adopting more pro-innovation policy. The, another enigma is innovation and inequality. Uh, from the work of Piketty, Saez, Atkinson, we know that the share of income of the top 1% income earners in the U.S. and the share of income of the U.S. top 0.1% earners have gone up over the past period, okay, since the 1980s. But what's very interesting is that innovation is a source of uh, uh, top income inequality. Why? Because when you innovate, you become rich, you get rents. For example, uh, you know, uh, uh, Steve Jobs became rich by inventing Apple. Mr. Skype became rich by inventing Skype. Mr. Uh, Bill Gates became rich by inventing Microsoft. Okay? And, uh, uh, but what's interesting is that it's a good source of top income because innovation generates growth, productivity growth. And uh, also, the advantage is that innovation, because it entails creative destruction, it increases social mobility, particularly innovation by new entrants is associated with more social mobility because you have newcomers replacing old guys and uh, uh, by replacing income. And that's about, all about social mobility. And because innovation, on the one hand, increases top income inequality, but on the other hand, also increases social mobility, we will see in a moment that it does not increase broad inequality. Here I show it's based on work with Blondel, Axigit, Bergeau, and Mousse, uh, US cross-state panel data. 
So it's a panel of states, of US states over time. And we look on the horizontal axis is the innovation intensity of a state in a given year. And the horizontal axis is the inequality measures in that state in that year. So the continuous curve is the share of the top 1% income earners in the state in the year. And you see that the more innovative a state is, where we measure innovation by the flow of citation-weighted patents, uh, the higher the innovation intensity in a state, the higher the share uh, of income of the top 1% income earners. So indeed, innovation is a source of top income inequality. But you see that now, if I look at a more global measure of inequality like the Gini, you see no effect of innovation intensity on the Gini. Uh, and, uh, but uh, you see what's interesting is that you see that innovation that we look in the same paper, we look, uh, we, take, we, be, we build on the work by Chetty et al on social mobility and we do cross commuting zones. And we see that in the uh, innovation, in the most innovative commuting zones, which is to the right, those are also the commuting zones with higher social mobility, where we measure social mobility by the probability that uh, uh, someone from a, fam a poor family uh, uh, goes all the way up, uh, uh, you know, in the income distribution. So someone from the bottom quintile, uh, uh, you know, what is the probability that someone whose parents were in the bottom quintile, uh, you know, uh, ends up in the top quintile of income distribution. And you see that there is innovation increases social mobility. So it's very interesting. Innovation is good. It gives you growth. It gives you social mobility. And as a result, it does not increase broad inequality. But lobbying, which is another source of top income, uh, is bad because lobbying is all about incumbents preventing new entry. That's bad for growth because you prevent new innovation by entrance. It's bad for social mobility because you reduce creative destruction and therefore you reduce social mobility. And because you reduce social mobility and you increase top income inequality, you, it increases broad inequality. So that's what we call Carlos Slim versus Steve Jobs. Uh, uh, Steve Jobs is, is a good source of top income because it's an innovation source of top income. Carlos Slim, which is uh, you know, a head of the unregulated telecom uh, monopoly in Mexico, is rich because he's at the head of a, uh, a non-regulated or not very regulated uh, uh, you know, uh, a telecom company. And that's a very different source of becoming rich. And you can see that uh, uh, here I look uh, uh, I, I again rank sta states uh, in the U.S. in given year by the amount of lobbying you have there. And you see that the states, the U.S. states in which you have most lobbying, they have a higher share of top 1% in top income earners. But also the Gini now, uh, which was not respondent to innovation intensity, in the states which have a, a higher lobbying intensity, whenever they have higher lobbying intensity, they also have higher Gini. So really, you can see that lobbying is a bad source of top income. And so uh, you have to distinguish between Steve Jobs and, and Carlos Slim. And that's my difference with Thomas Piketty. In the world of Thomas Piketty, you only have Carlos Slim. You don't have Steve Jobs. Okay? And, but now the thing is that no matter if you become rich like Steve Jobs or like Carlos Slim, still, well, I have to make sure you will not use your wealth to prevent subsequent innovators. But that you do not only through tax policy, you do that also through competition policy. And, and we need very much to look at tax policy and, and competition policy together. How long left do I have? How long do I have? Nadine, uh, how, long, how, many, how long more do I have? Three minutes. No, 10 minutes. Three minutes? 10. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. OK. So I would like to move right away to about rethinking capitalism. Uh, 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 the, the COVID was a revelator. COVID uh, revealed how poorly US does on social protection and uh, how poorly uh, Europe does on innovation. So let's show me first the US. Here, US is gray curve, Germany black curve. Uh, the triangles are the share of population with, uh, unemployed. It went up in the US with COVID. But uh, in the US, when you lose uh, uh, employment, with some probability, you lose health insurance. So you see that this is a, the circles are the share of population without health insurance. You see that in the US, it went down with the Obamacare. But it went up again you know, during the first lockdown, and uh, at the time where it should not have gone down. In Germany, every, you know, the, the, everybody has access to health insurance. The share of population in Germany without health insurance is always equal to zero. So you can see that, you know, against a shock like COVID, uh, 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 the vulnerable part of the population was much better pr protected in Germany than in the US. 
But oh, you can look at other indexes. For example, the Gini, which is a, a global measure of inequality, uh, uh, is higher in the US than in Germany, France, or Scandinavia. Poverty rate is much higher in the US than in Germany, France, or Scandinavia. Okay? And uh, 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 another thing which is also important to know is the, uh, from the work of Anne Case and Angus Deaton, is you look at the mortality rate of the middle-aged unskilled uh, white non-Hispanics. Uh, uh, and you see that uh, that's this continuous black curve. It has gone up a lot in the US since 2000. Uh, they, they go under stress of losing their job. And if they lose their job, they lose status, they fall into poverty, they lose health insurance. So they, the stress that this causes, uh, you make them take opioids, sleeping pills, uh, uh, eat pizza, and become fat, and all that, OK? And so whereas you know, in uh, uh, France or Germany, the, the mortality rate of this category on skilled uh, middle age uh, has gone down. Uh, 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 UK is a bit in between, OK? So that's interesting. That's on the social model, OK? But on the good, on the innovation side, the China, uh, if you look, for example, at the, at the flow of triadic patents, which are the number of patents per million inhabitants, uh, you see that the uh, uh, US is way above uh, the average EU and way above China still. And if you look at other measures, flow of uh, you know, top cited patents or whatever, on all these measures, US is way above everybody because they have a fantastic ecosystem of innovation, basic research, very well-funded, well-funded universities, NSF, NIH, uh, 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 Howard Hughes Medical Investigation, the HHMI to finance research, top research in biology, all that for basic research. Then they have venture capital very developed to turn that research into new firms, uh, uh, business angels. Then they have institutional investors to finance innovation in large firms. So they have a fantastic ecosystem of innovation in the US, not in Europe. And what we would like is to combine the good side of the American model, which is an innovative model, with the good side of the European model, which is more protective and inclusive. Some people believe that if you choose to be more innovative, it has to be at the expense of being inclusive and protective. And, and if you choose to be protective and inclusive, it has to be at the expense of being innovative. I believe that there are these three policies which makes you both more innovative and more protective and inclusive. One is flex security on the labor market, the Danish labor market model. One is education, in particular the Finnish education reform. And one is competition policy. So let me go into the, each of them. So as I told you in the US, uh, uh, you know, you have this phenomenon of increased mortality of white non Hispanics on skill, middle aged, okay? But in, in Denmark, they have a fantastic system. When you lose your job in Denmark, for two years, you get 90% of your salary, and the state helps you find a new job and retrain. Here is the consequence. Uh, uh, we look here, uh, uh, Alexandra Roulet, my colleague, look compared the, the health of a worker in a firm that closes down to the health of a worker identical in age, education, and experience in a firm in Denmark that doesn't close down. It's a diff in diff. And here is the, uh, the effect on annual probability to purchase antidepressants, comparing the, the, the treatment group, which is those who are in firms that close down, to identical individuals in firms that do not close down. And you see no effect on uh, uh, probability to purchase antidepressants, anti-anxiety, of becoming unemployed. No effect on probability to visit the hospital for circulatory problems. No effect on mortality either. So this system of flex security in fact, it makes creative destruction work much better in Denmark because it's now much easier in Denmark for firms to hire and lay off and change activities because the, uh, the state is there to help uh, individuals find new jobs and, uh, uh, and, uh, and it protects individuals. So that makes creative destruction work much better in Denmark because the state is there to help retrain individuals and help them find new jobs. So at the same time, they are protected. And it's, it's so the, the, this reform of flex security in Denmark uh, both in, in, uh, encouraged innovation by making creative destruction work much better, but it also uh, made uh, increased protection, you see. So the second policy is education. Uh, you might have seen the paper by Bell, Shetty, Jarabel, Petkova, and Rinan in the QGE, and they look at the probability of inventing of an individual as a function of the parental income. And you see that when you have parental income, uh, in the top income uh, centiles, uh, you have a higher, much higher probability to invent. This is on US recent data, Belchetti. 
you have similar finding by Axigid, Grigsby, Nicholas on historical US data. But here you have similar findings by uh, uh, myself, Axigit, Aitinen, and Toivanen on Finnish data. I was a bit surprised because in Finland, school is free and high quality. But in fact, in Finland, it turns out that the higher the parents who earn more are the more educated parents. And they transmit not only knowledge, but also aspirations to their children. And if I control for parental education, I go from the blue curve to the red curve. You see what I mean? And that already flattens out this relationship. But now I ask myself, if they have such a good education system accessible to everybody and high quality in Finland, why would even parental education matter? And in fact, what happened is that the, the education system became so uh, like it is now in Finland, only, uh, only as of uh, 1970. They had a big educational reform in 1970 where they made the education system much more broad-based and still very high quality. And you can see here, I look uh, at the ratio of the probability of inventing post for people who went to the education system after the reform uh, compared uh, to the people in the, uh, with the parents in the same uh, uh, you know, income bracket who went to the education system in Finland before the reform. And you can see that the reform increased a lot the probability of inventing for children whose parents were in that range of the income distribution. So uh, uh, it was very good because you see, in our countries, we have a lot of what we call uh, lost Einsteins. You have very smart kids, but they are born to poor families who cannot help them, who cannot give them the education and the aspirations. Now, when they had this education reform in Finland, they reduced the number of lost Einsteins. It made the economy more innovative, but also more inclusive because more people can take part in the innovation process. So that education, uh, and the kind of reform that Finland did in 1970 uh, uh, is something that makes you both more innovative and more inclusive. And finally, uh, I go back to conclude the, the competition. I told you that you had, you know, the U.S. went through, uh, you know, uh, has been since the early 2000s through a period of growth decline, and that the growth decline was associated with these uh, superstar firms becoming pervasive through merger and acquisition, which ended up discouraging entry by non-superstar firms. And that's made, uh, you know, that's what explains why the growth went down. If now you have a competition policy, it will make, of course, the economy in the US more innovative because these new potential entrants can enter. But we also know that entrant innovation is good for social mobility. I, I mentioned that when I talked about inequality. So if you have the good, a good competition reform in the US, it will make the US economy both more innovative and more inclusive. And so at the end of the day, uh, Schumpeter was very afraid that the first innovators would turn into entrenched incumbents that would prevent subsequent innovation. One response is to have the state impose competition policy. But we know, for example, when I talked about the middle income trap, that the state can be captured by private firms. And we know that there is enormous amount of lobbying in the US also and in other developed countries. So that's where the civil society is important. As a, as, a, as a check and balance, as a watchdog, civil society, which means the voters, the media, etc., are there to denounce collusions between the state, between state executives and incumbent firms. And that's why this triangle is the response to Schumpeter's fear that the first innovators would turn into entrenched conglomerates and prevent subsequent innovation. Firms, the state and civil society together, they can make sure, they can they can be there to avert the pessimistic prediction of Schumpeter and make sure that creative destruction keeps going. But there is another virtue of the triangle. It will make sure also you go towards greener growth because firms, as we explain in the book and in my work, you know, firms that used to innovate in dirty technologies tend to continue innovating in dirty technologies. That's what we call past dependence. And we talk about that in chapter nine of the book. So you need the state and civil society to redirect firms' innovation towards green technologies. The state can do it with carbon tax, uh, 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 also three with in green industrial policy and with subsidies to uh, green innovation. So the state has a number of instruments to redirect firms' innovation towards green technologies. But civil society also can redirect because civil society, you have the name and shame. Now we know, more, you know increasingly better the CO2 content of the output and the inputs of firms. So we can rank firms. 
and we can, you know, have uh, there is now new ratings of firms according to whether they are virtuous uh, 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 in terms of uh, lower CO2 emissions or, in, or whether they are not virtuous. And consumers tend to go now and consume from more virtuous firms. And so this, this consumer information together with competition on the, on the product market uh, tends, in fact, I, I, I saw that in recent work with Roland Benabou, Alexandra Oula, and Ralph Martin, this, this, the, the consumer's information together with competition on the product market is a very powerful force to uh, oblige uh, firms to innovate greener. So you see the, the triangle uh, uh, is also key to green innovation. Uh, firms innovate, but the state can make sure they innovate greener, but the state will civil society, society together. And uh, uh, I think I will, that's my book, The Power of Creative Destruction, with Céline Antonin and Simon Bunel. There is another book now uh, forthcoming in July, which is a book of, of uh, chapters. It's a first three volume, in fact, uh, uh, edited also by Harvard University Press, but edited by Ufuk Exiged and John Van Rinen, uh, which was... Uh, based on a festive conference uh, honoring my work with Peter Howitt and uh, with a foreword by Emmanuel Macron. And uh, I, I will stop there. Thank you very much. Was I okay, uh, more or less? I went much over the 30 minutes. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me, yes. Professor Aguyang? Yes, I could hear you. Good. Could you hear me? Yeah. Could you hear uh, me? Yeah, we can hear you. OK, could you see my slides? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we saw your slides uh, very clearly in the last half an hour. And, OK, uh, OK. Yeah, it okay. was a fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, first you. of all, let me uh, say hello. Uh, it's. Um, Good For me, you. it's a very exciting opportunity to meet you in person uh, because when I was a graduate student at uh, Stanford, I started to oh. read your paper. Uh, oh. Yeah, your, your early paper with uh, Professor Tirol on formal and real authority in organization. Absolutely, yes. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan ah. of that paper. Uh, ah. In fact, my, uh, my professor, Professor uh, Milgram, he's also a fan of that paper as well. Oh, so, that's um, right. I, I am, I am a I'm a big fan of Paul Milgram. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, very nice to, uh, to meet you in person. Very and nice thanks, to meet uh, you. Thanks for your very, um, very interesting uh, presentation today. Uh, I'm going to ask you several questions uh, that um, yes. Yes. Uh, some of the questions may not have been sent to you because I, I just thought of the questions when I uh, when I listen to your speech. Uh, I see. So let me start with my first question. Um, yes. Uh, your, your discussion on inequality and innovation uh, yes. was very interesting. Um, my question for you is this. Um, if you use a Gini coefficient, uh, you know, the, the bottom yes. 99% Gini coefficient, yes. you don't see a lot of... Uh, change no. uh, in uh, inequality in the last yeah. uh, 20 or 30 years. However, yeah. if you look at uh, the, the contrast between middle income households versus the top 1%, the gap is certainly much bigger in the last 30 ah, years. No. Yeah, no, no, and I was not claiming that you don't have an increase in the Gini. I said that, the, that innovation does not make the Gini go up. Yeah, that's, I mean? that's, yeah that's, that's precisely yeah. my question. Do you think innovation contributed to the gap between the top 1% and middle class? Because uh, the perception of middle class was that in the last 30 years, the middle class people here, they did not benefit from innovation. They did not benefit from uh, globalization. All the benefits were captured by the top 1% or 2%. Was that perception correct? But in fact, no, uh, what, the, what the study in the U.S. shows is that if the gap between the, the you know, if the gap between uh, middle class and, and top has gone up, it's not because so much innovation has gone up, it's because, in fact, you had the emergence of these superstar firms who concentrated rents. So, uh, so it's, it's not because you had uh, growth, it's because you have not enough growth and innovation. You see, that's the thing. 
It's not because you have too much innovation. It's, uh, you can see that the, the concentration of rents in the US went together, went along with you know, a, a slowing down of growth. And why? Because these firms that became superstar firms, they concentrated rents, but at the same time, they discouraged new innovations. You see what I mean? And, uh, uh, and that's what you've seen. So it's not the innovation that uh, is not the, it's because you have the lack of entrant innovation uh, and the concentration of rents that you had both uh, the increase in inequality and, uh, and the declining growth. Thank you. So that comes to my next question. Yes. So your, your remedy for such a concentration of rents is uh, yeah. competition law. So my question is, you, you, you said at the beginning there has to be a balance you know, yeah. between competition law and also providing incentive for people to innovate. And one of the incentive, of course, yeah. is the monopoly rents. So how to strike that balance if you enforce the competition law too much? Are you going to hurt yeah. you're the right. incentive it's to innovate? You're right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. If you have too much competition, you end up, uh, the relationship between competition and innovation is an inverted U, in fact. But we are still in the upward part of the inverted U. If you had completely too much competition, you would end up discouraging. But you, you know, you have this other effect of competition, which is that you innovate to escape competition. So if I say, well, if you don't innovate, you will be subject a lot to competition. But if you innovate, you will be able to escape competition. So you can see that that effect of escape competition is very strong. Of course, when competition is already very high, uh, uh, the, the, the effect that you mentioned ends up being stronger than the escape competition effect. But we are in the region of competition at the moment where the dominant effect is the escape competition. You see that uh, the, the main effect is the head of the classroom working harder to remain the head of the classroom. That effect for now is, is dominant effect. Well, here the comes what my... what I call the Schumpeterian effect. Yeah. Here comes my you next see? question. Yes. The question is regarding the, the economies of scale that we see in the technology sector, in the, in yeah. the, in the, in the new economy. Because the, the bigger the scale gets, the lower the cost, the lower the price. So consumer yeah. does benefit from yeah. the large scale of some of the technology companies. However, if you have a very large scale for a particular firm, that firm will be dominating and will prevent exactly. competition. That's, that's the trade-off. So how do you, you balance to... between the scale benefit versus competition benefit? You're right. That's a, it's a good trade-off. It's true that a large firm can have the advantage of, although, uh, uh, you know, if it becomes a monopoly, even if the cost is low, the firm will charge a monopoly price. It's demand that will determine the price. You see what I mean? So if you become a natural monopoly, uh, you need to regulate a firm like this. So you see, that's why, you know, uh, you want to have as much competition as you can, but there are some sectors that where you, you can't have a, a, comp a competition in all segments. For example, some segments of networks, or, or, some, or for example, you cannot have two Boeings. You have only one Boeing company in the US and you have Airbus in, in Europe. Uh, there, well, yeah, they compete huh, with each other. But it's important when you have natural monopolies that then you have regulation. And uh, you need, that's why co the regulation and competition uh, 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 are complementary instruments. You see what I mean? You can, there are some segments where you, you have these natural monopolies and regulation is the, is the natural tool to deal with that. Yeah. Very good. Let me continue with that because I have one more question along that line. If you, yes. compare, if you compare Europe against yeah. China, yeah. you see these two regions, they adopted very different policy. The Chinese yeah. policy was not competition. Chinese policy was firewall. Chinese policy was prevent, you know, players like Google or, or Facebook to come in. And as a result, I mean, unintended consequence was that Chinese produced its own technology company like Alibaba, like Tencent. Yeah. And now yeah. these companies are competing against Facebook and, 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 and Google globally. So that's unintended consequence of Chinese policy. It's not a competition policy, by the way. It's a, a, a policy of closing its door uh, to competition. So that's my, my, first, my first observation. Yeah. But I look at yeah. Europe, right? If you look at Europe, Europe, 
I don't know what kind of policy they use. You can tell me better what policy Europe did. But what we can see is that Europe did not, in the end, produce its own technology giants. So what did, what did Europe, what did China do right? Yeah. And yeah. what did yeah. Europe do wrong yeah. Yeah. in this uh, connection? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, in fact, I mean, uh, China did a bit of what I would call infant industry. Uh, you say, you know, I prevent, I prevent a bit competition because I want to acquire knowledge in some areas, and then I can develop my firms, and then I can compete worldwide. Uh, uh, so there was some infant policy in, the, in China. China was not at the same stage as Europe. China was in a catching up, in a catching up mode. For, uh, Europe had been in a catching up mode after the war, but uh, then was more advanced. So it... Uh, but, you know, it's true that uh, uh, they did some, uh, uh, you know, inf uh, infant industry policy and some smart uh, industrial policy. So you are, you are asking, should you do industrial policy? I believe that in some areas uh, uh, where you have coordination problems, where, you know, uh, 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 you have big spillovers over uh, other parts of the economy, uh, where you want, to, for some reasons, to redirect uh, innovation, there is a case for industrial policy, for sectoral policy. For example, for, uh, Europe should have pushed more uh, digital. They should put more defense. They should push more health sector through a smart industrial policy. Uh, but uh, the question is, can you make industrial policy consistent with competition? And there the US have been uh, pioneers. They created the DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency in the 50s, because they were racing with the Soviet Union. They needed, you know, uh, Gagarin was in space. They needed to put a man in space shortly to, you know, to compete with the, uh, the, the Soviet Union and to develop weapons to compete with the Soviet Union. The basic technology, the basic knowledge was there, but you had to, to coordinate and, and uh, you know, uh, coordinate forces, actors and resources to, uh, uh, to turn this basic knowledge into uh, industrial applications very quickly on particular missions. And that's why the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency was very important. The money comes from the, the government, the US government. They have team leaders, and the team leaders elicit competing projects. And th that proved to be very important in defense and space. Uh, GPS, internet, autonomous navigation, all these came directly or indirectly from DARPA. And recently, it was BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority. You had the basic... Uh, RNA te uh, messenger technology, you want to turn that into production of mass production of vaccines based on RNA messenger in one year. And that's BARDA, which is the equivalent of DARPA for bio, uh, the biotech, uh, made that possible because, again, uh, you, uh, you uh, elicited many com competing labs and they came up with this, uh, and you had a whole uh, logistic to mass produce the thing that worked well. So it's a very smart way to do industrial policy in the US to combine industrial policy and make it still competition friendly. So because that's the whole challenge. You want to have competition policy, but you want, and sometimes you, in some sectors, you want to have also industrial policy. So the, the Europe, the problem of competition policy in Europe, it was, it was much more inward looking. We were obsessed by market share within Europe. So for example, whenever a merger leads to higher market share within Europe, we prevent that merger. We don't look at competition with China and with the US. And so the problem, the pitfall of competition policy in Europe was to be too much inward looking. It was not so much about competition with US and China, whereas China was all about competition with US and Europe. And that's the problem of competition policy in Europe. So we have to be much more outward looking. And, and, uh, and uh, also when we decide whether or not to allow for merger and acquisition, we should look whether this merger and acquisition prevents new entry or new uh, innovation instead of being obsessed by market share and market definition. Uh, and, and I think we need to reform competition policy in Europe. You see, so, so I think China uh, did smart infant industry and industrial policy and competed on the world market with the US and Europe. Uh, uh, we should do more of that in Europe. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, that was a very interesting discussion. Uh, let me move to my next, next bucket of yeah. uh, questions, which is on uh, green. Yes. Green innovation. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned in your presentation briefly. Uh, maybe you can elaborate a little more in terms of uh, what kind of policies uh, you would recommend uh, for countries to yeah. uh, to promote yeah. green innovation, and also how can uh, developing countries uh, to uh, how can them how can developing countries benefit 
from green innovation uh, globally, yeah. uh, including in the yeah. advanced yeah. economies? Yeah. Alors, first, in advanced economies, uh, 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 to move faster, and you see with the, uh, you know, we, we say, well, you know, I, I told you that innovations are not spontaneously green. Firms innovate, but they don't spontaneously innovate in green technologies. Whenever you innovated in combustion engine or, you know, uh, polluting technologies, you tend to continue in the past, you tend to continue spontaneously to innovate in dirty technologies in the future. So you need the state to redirect, uh, 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 you know, firms' technical change towards clean and firms' innovation towards clean technologies. And how can the state do that? The state can do that through carbon tax, the carbon price. If you increase carbon tax, that will uh, reduce the profitability of producing and innovating in dirty technologies. So that's one instrument. But with Putin, we had a huge carbon tax in Europe, you see? Now the carbon tax in Europe is called Mr. Putin. So we don't need in Europe to increase much the carbon tax because Putin did it for us. But we need another leg, which is green industrial policy. We need in Europe to have the equivalent of the BARDA or the DARPA, you have the ARPA energy in the US. We need in Europe to create the equivalent of the ARPA energy to push innovation in new, uh, to, in, in new sources of energy, which are clean sources of energy. But at the same time, we also need, we have technologies already which are green. We just need to implement them on a large scale. For example, for electric cars, we need to have better batteries. And we need to build, you know, charges of the batteries everywhere in, on our territories. This means a huge capital investment. So that means that countries need to invest a lot in capital because capital will replace uh, uh, fuel uh, energy. But the problem we have is that we have big debt already, big public debt, uh, uh, especially after COVID. And the problem is that how can we, at a time of inflation, where interest rate will go up, uh, invest a lot in this implementation of these new, uh, of these green technologies, when we have already a lot of debt. So that's a big uh, e challenge that we have. So, so first is to, 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 to make this capital investment to already implement on a larger scale green technologies that are already available. But then we also need at the same time to uh, make use of intermediate sources of energy like uh, shell gas that we have also in Europe, and also to invest in innovation for finding new sources of energy. So the state has these instruments, carbon price, and this big DARPA, this big industrial policy to uh, subsidize in, uh, green innovation and invest in uh, green technologies. But the civil society is also important. Consumers with a name and shame uh, can also decide to consume from firms that are more virtuous. And informing consumers uh, is very important, and particularly when you are in a competitive environment, because you are virtuous, I am not, but still, I am forced to become virtuous if I don't want to lose my consumers to you. And uh, that uh, turns out to be as important, even more important than the carbon price. So those are all the instruments available to uh, governments and, uh, and civil society in developed countries to, to, uh, to speed up in, uh, the energy transition. Now, developing countries, the problem is that they are not rich, so you have to transfer uh, green technologies to, uh, uh, and the capital to uh, developing countries. And there, I think sovereign wealth funds, you know, like of the type that Al Gore had in mind and Stiglitz and others are very important because you need to finance the transfer of these technologies to less developed countries, like your transfer, like for vaccines, you know, what Michael Kramer would say about vaccines also applies to green technologies. And we need to find instruments, maybe for the G20 would set that up, to transfer green technologies to uh, less developed, uh, less developed economies, and I think we we need to find these new financial instruments. Thank you, thank you, Professor. Um, uh, because we are close to the end, let me uh, let me move to my last question, uh, which is on yes. our theme today. Uh, we have our annual uh, statistic forum at the IMF, and uh, the theme this year is uh, measuring tangible benefits of intangible capital. So, uh, Professor, from your perspective, what kind of improvements, what kind of improvements you would recommend for statisticians uh, in terms of better capturing the benefits of intangible, the benefits of innovation in our statistics? Um. 
So I think there's been a lot of progress on measuring patterns. Uh, uh, you see, recently, if you look at, uh, 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 be before we used to measure the quality of patterns by cit looking at citations. Now we can look at the text of the patent. So uh, there's been a lot of research work, you know, using text of patents to measure the extent to which you are being innovative. So that's one measure. All the metrics on patents, there is huge improvement. Another thing is also new cre creation of new firms, new firm creation, new product introduction. Those are also measures that go beyond patents. Productivity growth is also very one, but you know the problem is that we don't know how to where you may measure productivity growth, in particular because creative destruction, we don't know how to measure. You see, when we measure inflation, we, we look at products that were there yesterday and today, and we only for this class of products we can calculate the inflation rate. But those do not include products for which you, ha you have a new product replacing an old product, and those are those for which the quality improvement, the improvement in the quality of the service is biggest. So as a result, because we don't know how to factor in creative destruction in our measurement of how much is inflation and how much is real productivity growth, we tend to underestimate productivity growth. And with uh, the work I did with Pete Klino, it's in the American Economic Review now, uh, in, paper, in joint work with Pete Klino, Timo Bopart, uh, Antonin Bergeau, and Yui Lee, we found a way to measure by how much you understate productivity growth looking at entry and exit and looking at the, you know, those who were there yesterday and today, the stayers, uh, which share of the economy they were yesterday, which share of the economy they are today. And if you had, if you made no mistake by ignoring creative destruction, these guys should be the same share of the economy yesterday and today. But typically they tend to become a lower share of the economy today than they were yesterday. And that allows you to measure how much by how much, you know, the uh, statistical institutes tend to underestimate productivity growth when they don't factor in creative destruction. So you see, there are all these kind of things you can do to, uh, uh, to improve measurement of, uh, you know, of uh, innovation and innovation-led growth. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor. We are exactly on time. Perfect. And uh, we, uh, we have all learned a lot uh, from you today. And uh, if you Thanks come so to- much. If you come to Washington in the future, please yes. let us know. We would love to I, take I you out be, for, for lunch or dinner. I will be most happy to meet, uh, to meet you in person. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Well, this was a great end to, uh, to our two days. Very inspiring. Discussion. You could have listened to it for uh, an hour longer, as I must say. Um, <clears throat> but again, this is the end of the statistical forum. Um, we heard about intangible assets. Um, what are they? Why is it important to measure them? Uh, we heard from my users. We heard about the effects on economic growth, on productivity, on competition, on um, scalability, um, fiscal policy. Um, we saw some attempts to actually measure them in our macroeconomic statistics. We heard what we will do in the new macroeconomic standards, the BPM and the SNA. Um, we went to some innovative things, we uh, NFTs, we went to it in the metaverse, and we went to do what we statisticians actually do now in measuring with service and big data, um, well, the intangibles. And actually it's clear that there's so much more work to do uh, but this is great. This is why we get paid our salaries. This is why we are here. We want to do that. We want to take up that challenge and, and do the things that were asked from us and also uh, the things that uh, Professor Aguillon mentioned at the end. So I'd like to um, thank you all uh, for attending, uh, both in person and uh, virtually. Um, for some people all over the world, this will be um, not so friendly times, sometimes in the middle of the night, but thanks for attending. Thanks for your participation. Thanks to the organizers. Um, I've seen uh, many people of uh, my department walking around very, um, well, hard, working very hard. I see Maria, I see Jennifer, but there are many, many more. Uh, just thank you. I'm so proud of the people in my department who put this together, both the program. And I want a separate applause for them. <clears throat> So 
So with this, we will think how to keep the important messages we learned these past two days. Obviously, we have a website with presentations. We write a blog or whatever, but I think we need to do more. We should try to keep the network, the messages, the knowledge we gain. So we'll think about that. Not today. Today we'll have some celebration on a successful statistical forum. But some of the coming weeks, we'll come back to that and um, keep the things we learned in this network. So thank you all. I wish you all good travels back home. Thanks for attending, and hopefully see you at the 11th Forum next year.